All right, this is a re-recording of uh, the 31st of last month, and we're going to be talking about rules of inference as well as just basically going over this lecture. Again, it'll be obviously shorter than the lecture itself. Um, so the first was a, a question of towards the end of the previous section when it talked about bit operation and bitwise operation. And so if we're going to talk about... Uh, the idea of bitwise operators. The idea of bitwise operators is to first talk about what a bit is. And so a one bit can be considered uh, equivalent to true, a zero bit can be equivalent to false, and we have all the normal bit ops. So for example, as a bit operation for the AND, where you have the same operators like false and false is false, false and true is false, true and false is false, but true and true is true. Except we're going to use bits instead, and so 0 and 0 is 0, etc. And then to go from a bitwise operation uh, to, from a bit operation to a bitwise operation would be just the idea of taking a bit string, which would be, for example, if you want to do a bit string, we could have, say, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0. It's just a sequence of zeros and ones. And so normally we put a visual block in between to do grouping sizes just to make life easier as we visualize it. They don't have to be grouped in any particular sort. So 4 tends to be the, the typical pattern. So if we would take the exclusive OR um, operator, you could go through here, and if we have 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 0, 0, 1, then we would just go vertically, and the exclusive OR, uh, a true exclusive OR true is logically false, so that's the same thing as 1 exclusive OR 1 is logically 0. And so that's what every one of these columns are as we go across. And so you could do an AND, an XOR, an OR, operator and you can do other operators as well. It's just a a bit operation vertically stacked and then we go across and obviously used in uh, computational work. Um, another question that was asked was how do we write down specifically if we would have English say the sum of the squares of two integers uh, is greater than or equal to the square of the sum really just gets down to blocking out different components. You know, you would have the idea of sum. What does sum mean? That means addition. A square, you know, what does a square mean? It's the square of an integer is going to be i squared is the square. Greater than is going to be my greater than. And the greater than is strictly the greater than symbol or equal to, that's equal, so greater than or equal gets the whole idea of greater or equal. And what we have is that the sums of the squares is right there, is greater than or equal to the square of the sum. And this will be true for all numbers. And one of the questions you could always ask on something like this is when's it true, when's it false? If you have a universal statement of the following like that, if it's going to be false, you would need a counterexample. As was mentioned in that lecture, which that class is, well, you know, this isn't true. Uh, we could think of a simple counterexample that, for example, x equals 2, y equals 2, and that's not true. And so therefore, um, the above statement is, is, is false. All right, uh, for 1.6, when we talk about the rules of inference, uh, mathematical arguments is, at their heart are just going to be simple, useful tautologies. The idea of an argument is normally when you would go with an argument with somebody, you would lay out what you were talking about. I'm going to tell you part one and part two and part three up to part end and take all those put together and I'm going to come up with my grand conclusion. And that would be either true or it would be not true. And so the idea of an argument or a mathematical argument in particular is we could sit there and say things one after another and say that I have premise one, I have premise two, I have premise n, and then all put together, all of these make sense to me, and therefore I could put them all together and say that I have the following conclusion follows, and your implication to the person is I'm telling you the truth. So really what we're looking for mathematically 
is that we would have these premises are going to be pro compound propositions that are stated, that are conjunctive in nature, and it naturally follows that we have the conclusion. All of this, all of this mathematics together here is our argument as we go through it. Now, a person would be telling you the truth in their argument, say premise one and premise two and premise three, therefore I'm going to have this conclusion. They'll have been honest with you, you'd know it, is if everything that they put together is, a, is true, right? And so the idea of when we have arguments, we're talking about when our, what type of useful tautologies. We're talking about we want to be speaking in true ways as we go through these discussions and, and having the uh, val validity of it at the end. Now, if I have any implication, like for example, if this is your argument, if your argument is this whole we have our premises, we have our conclusions. You know, the premises can be true or false. Really, the idea of validity, you know, if we would look at the first component here, you know, if your premises are ever false, your argument is obviously still a tautology because false implies anything. So that'd be a vacuous statement. You know, if you're if you have a, ever have a false in your premise. So if a person goes up here and they could sneak in an argument to simply say that if they would go and state one of these premises, and these one of these premises is a lie, but then the entire argument is going to be valid, but it's going to be valid in a vacuous way. It's an empty argument. Sure, it's, it's true, but it's true only because it's empty. You haven't actually stated anything of use. And so that's a vacuous uh, statement. Really, the question becomes row one and row two. If your premises here are both true, then the conclusion needs to be true. If I want to have an argument that's valid, what we would want to have is, is that true premises always imply a true conclusion. True premises cannot have a false conclusion. We want to show that's impossible. Now, what we want to always talk about, we want to only have tautologies. We want to, we want to work with things that are true to have it work. Now, if I had an argument where instead of using specifics, that instead of specifics, uh, we're using propositional variables. This is not particularly called an argument. We would actually denote this as an argument form. And the idea of argument forms are, you know, to go through a particular problem and say, it really doesn't matter what propositions you put in, any propositions, this conclusion would be valid. And so it's valid for no matter what you say. That's a valid argument form where it's a tautology regardless of the substitution. And so these valid argument forms uh, that get used a lot are going to get their own name. And so valid argument forms here that these are tautologies if they get used a lot we give them the title which is the whole section that we're talking about rule of inference so the idea of the rule of inference is to say that okay th this is to infer correctly what you're talking about and so if we use them a lot, the, these rules of inference get their own individual names, like modus ponens or modus tollens. And so what we're looking for, again, is a useful tautology. And a classic example here would be, here's a rule of inference. This is the actual tautology. The useful tautology is this. This I could show to be logically always true. You could show something is logically true. You could, you could do this. You can show this. It's logically true by, you know, tables, argument, right, uh, as we go through it, uh, or older rules of inference. Of, of which we have none so far, but those are the three techniques that we're going to be talking about. Would be these three as we go through problems. So, 
Um, you know, if P then Q, you have P, hence you have Q. That's always a tautology. doesn't matter what P, Q are. So it's like, you know, if my string coffee, then lions wear tutus. My string coffee, therefore lions wear tutus. It really doesn't matter the truth value of what you just said. The entire thing is a valid argument because the entire thing's a tautology. And so modus ponens, we get to the idea of P implies Q and then P. Uh, on the other hand, another valid uh, tautology would be if P then Q, you don't have Q, therefore you don't have P. This is really, if we would look at this, this is actually, you could go through here and say, well, wait a second. Um, that's logically the same as not Q implies not P. I don't have Q, hence I don't have P. Well, that's just modus ponens. So modus tollens is really kind of a different way of looking at modus ponens, except what I'm taking is uh, the, I'm using, it uses, so modus uh, tollens used modus ponens to, sh to actually be valid, because, you know, we would have, it. well, that's logically the same thing as not Q implies not P, which is contrapositive. Um, for all of the rules of inference, there's many ways that you can look at it as you go through, you guys, it's been said in different lectures. So each of these are going to be useful tautologies. You could go through here and say that, okay, if it's true that P implies Q and it's true that Q implies R, therefore we would have a valid conclusion of P implies R. Again, it doesn't matter what P, Q, and R are. That Those are going to be a valid tautology, and we would give it, if it's used a lot, give it its own name, hypothetical syllogism. If I have apples or, so I have an apple or I have an orange, so if we would break it up in that way, so if a person says, I have an apple or I have an orange, by the way, I don't have an apple, well, obviously, you have an orange. That's called disjunctive syllogism. Addition, if you ever want to throw on another proposition to what you just said, you could say things like, I have P, hence, I have P, or I have Q. So again, we could look at the idea that I have uh, a phone. A valid conclusion to that is, I have a phone or I have my keys. You can always add any proposition you want by just plugging it under an or. Uh, simplification. If I have a phone and I have my keys, hence, I have my keys. I also could have said, hence, I have my phone. If you have two things and you're told you had them both, but you want to only talk about one of them, you can. So if you have your and here, you could just simply talk about one instead of both. Uh, the same way uh, the conjunctive form here, conjunction has like, if you have P, you do some other work, and then and you have Q, you could definitely say that you have P and Q at the same time. So if I could go through a problem and say, I show that I have a phone, and I have shoes and a shirt, and all these other, and I have my keys, eventually you could just say, I have a phone and my keys at the same time. And uh, resolution for this type here is really just a different way of looking at a hypothetical syllogism because both of these here can be written as implication and that can be written as implication but in the end you could uh, give it its own name if you want to call it that then let's say I have my phone or I have my keys it's also true that I don't have my phone or I'm wearing shoes therefore I have keys or shoes that's the idea of resolution but it's also a direct application of hypothetical syllogism. Now, all of these are tautologies. These are true no matter what things you plug in for the variables. These are always be a tautological in nature. So, typically, sometimes people pass off a contingency, things that are not a tautology, as if they were. And if you do that, that's bad reasoning because you're saying, hey, look, this is true, and it's not. So mistakes like that, if they get used a lot, are going to be called a fallacy. So if you would have a compound proposition, so we have our compound proposition, it is not a fallacy, but everybody's acting as if it is, and they're wrong. They're wrong in this, that it's like you goof off a lot, then you have, you know, their own special names for it. So for example under the fallacy of affirming the conclusion. I can look at this and say, all right, what would be an example if I would go through a problem and say that if Mark is a murderer, then I have 
blood on my hands, right? Now, what's correct is to, you must affirm the hypothesis. So valid reasoning would be, if Mark is a murderer, then he has bloody hands. Well, let's check. Is Mark a murderer? And you verify it. You say, yes, Mark is a murderer. Then you would immediately know the conclusion is, I'm going to have bloody hands. On the other hand, a typical, that's correct, but typically people get this particular thing backwards. So they would go through it and say, you know what, if Mark is a murderer, then he has bloody hands. And then I walk into the class and I notice that I have, and people look at me and they say, oh, wait a second, uh, Mark has bloody hands. And then you would go through this and, oh no, he's a murderer. And you're all worried about it. And the answer is, no, this is, you're supposed to affirm the hypothesis, not the conclusion, right? But people do that all the time. If he's a murderer, he has bloody hands. Oh, no, he has bloody hands. He must be a murderer. And it's like, no, that's wrong. I fell on the way to class, and I've got bloody hands. And so a typical, you're supposed to affirm the, the hypothesis, but people make the mistake all the time of affirming the conclusion. You cannot come up with a conclusion if you just simply have the include you know the bloody hand sitting there on the second part of that implication so you just say all right that particular thing is a fallacy same way here you're supposed to deny the hypothesis you know the idea that if I'm a murderer then I have bloody hands well if I don't have bloody hands then I can't be a murderer well other people say well if he's a murderer then he has bloody hands well Mark's not a murderer well then he's not gonna have bloody hands well I could I could have fallen down the same way that's again you're passing off this thing that is not a tautology as if it is. You're saying this is valid reasoning. It is not. So if you affirm the conclusion, that's a fallacy. If you deny the hypothesis, that is a fallacy. You're not allowed to do those things. Those are not tautologies. Okay, well, what are some tautologies that occur using the quantifiers? Well, the tautologies that occur in the quantifiers would be first, if you're told that everyone has a property if I'm told that everyone in the room has a particular property, that means I could go through this and say that for any particular C, the property is true. So if I would say that if everybody in the everybody in the room is a math major, then it doesn't matter which person. I would say I could say John is a math major, Mark is a math major. I could just simply pick a C in particular and just have that as a valid conclusion. That's fine. Normally, when you do this, is that later on and if this is a discussion of some sort and you want to talk about me you would say if everybody in the room is a math major later on you're talking about Mark you would say okay Mark's a math major because we're talking about Mark you wouldn't talk about somebody else like Jane so usually pick the instance of usefulness and so since that's picking an instance that's why this is called universal instantiation now if I said someone in this room is a math major then what I would have to do is I actually have to I have to find this person and so if I said someone in the room is a math major I would have to go through the entire room and find the instance where it's true maybe it's true for one or more but I have to find it and so finding an instance this is called existential instantiation now sometimes instead of going from this is from generalities to specifics so that's instantiation I'm picking an instant sometimes we go the other way we have a specific people named and I want to use the words like general like all or some those are generalization of things because I'm not telling you who I'm just using the word all or some so if you find that you go through the entire room and for anybody in the room that they're a math major you don't have to you can ignore who you actually checked and just simply say everyone is a math major on the other hand if you find some person in the room who's a math major like mark is a math major i can throw away mark and just simply say somebody in this room is a math major so what we're going is from specifics an instant to generalize and so we're using all or some and so we call it generalization so that's everything from 1.6, a little bit tighter because there weren't any questions or, or obviously nobody can ask me any problems. But it's a, it's a re-recording so that we can go through this again to fix that one issue. All right, uh, that should be everything.